I am glad to introduce our speaker today, uh, Mr. Kent Elson Sorgon. Kent is currently a um, Master of Science student in zoology, uh, taking up a minor in marine science at UPLB, and he, uh, he's studying the evolution of body shape in races. He obtained his uh, BS Biology from the University of Santo Tomas in 2016. Um, and he is currently working and uh, affiliated with the uh, UP Marine Science Institute as a project-based research associate. An avid scuba diver, Kent is an um, etiologist who studies coral reef fishes. His uh, research interests include uh, reef fish ecology, evolution, and taxonomy and systematics, as well as using geometric morphometrics and phylogenetic comparative methods to answer, difficult, uh, to answer different um, reef fish related questions. He has assisted in many government uh, and NGO funded surveys of different coral reefs in the country, including, the, including an expedition to survey the coral reefs of uh, Panawan Island in Southern Leyte in 2020. Kent is currently a member of the Philippine Aquatic Red List Committee, Cartilaginous Fishes and Demersal Bony Fishes Subcommittees, and the IUCN Grouper and RAS uh, Specialist Group, and the Philippine Association of Marine Science. When not crunching numbers or looking at fish intensely and counting characters in the laboratory, uh, he likes drawing scientific illustrations using traditional and digital methods. Friends, everyone, let us all welcome Kent Sorgon. Um, hello, good afternoon. Okay, so can everyone see your presentation? Um, Yes, slide? yes. We can okay. see the, the slide. Okay. Um, so to start my presentation again, good afternoon to everyone. Magandang hapon sa lahat. Uh, Sir Floor, thank you very much for the introduction. Again, my name is Kevin Sorgon. My pronouns are he and his. And um, yeah, I'm currently a graduate student at the University of the Philippines, Los Panos. So, so just a, an, a re, to, just to re reiterate what Sir Floor has mentioned earlier, I'm currently a master's uh, grad student at UPLB. You know, I'm taking up the Master of Science in Zoology with a minor in Marine Science. And while I'm a scientist by day, uh, most of the work I do revolves around a science. I also uh, make scientific illustrations at night and weekends whenever I have time. So um, I'm interested in many things, but all of them are related to fish. You can, if, if you want, if for convenience, you can call me a fish nerd. And um, I'm interested mainly in the ecology, evolution, taxonomy, and systematics of reef fishes. And in general, I'm very interested in natural history collections and using geometric morphometrics, like shape analysis, and um, molecular phylogenetics and phylogenetic comparative methods to answer different um, questions relating to how fishes came to be, you know, how reef fishes came to be. And so to guide us um, in this presentation, here's a very short um, outline of what I'm going to talk about um, in this uh, uh, presentation for, um, for this meeting. So first, let's, uh, I'll introduce you the concept and definition of reef fishes are. Um, so what are reef fishes, how they came to be, uh, how many species do we have in the Philippines? And um, to follow this uh, topic, we, we look at the history of uh, reef fish studies in the Philippines, so particularly uh, in the first portion by focusing on uh, from uh, a century's worth of information from the 1800s to 1900s, so just a bit uh, before the turn of the millennium. And then uh, we look at recent trends in reef fish research, so from the past two decades. So, so to, to, to look at present uh, research efforts of what, what we are looking at now, what we what we have studied in the past two decades, we then turn to um, avenues for research efforts uh, in the future. So where can we work on next? Or what, what areas of study can we build on? Or, and yeah, so after the outline, so let me introduce to you the definition of a reef fish. So 
if I title this um this outline title as is dang bato no is da bato uh, as a, as a, as a way to introduce you the concept of refishes which we call in tagalog um isang bato no, typically uh, generally and we refer to refishes right? the, the name is quite self explanatory but um the definition of refishes is simply defined as fishes that are that you can find in or are characteristic of uh, when you go to a typical coral reef. And so these are fishes that use coral reefs as their habitat. So for example, uh, the butterfly fish, or this butterfly fish eats um, soft coral tissue and like and takes shelter in different uh, nooks and crannies of the reef. So uh, it considers the reef as its habitat. And this coral gobi, no by the history of, uh, is a uh, is exclusively found in course of the genus Acropora. So, uh, so some of these are just some of the representative taxa that call coral reefs food. But there are also um, some species that uh, use coral reefs as a food source only. So these are quite um, transitory in nature. So they're very mobile species that um, that can move uh, tens and tens and to up to hundreds of kilometers and searching food. In different reefs, so just like these blue fincher bells. And so, when we say fishes that are characteristic of coral reefs, we refer to reef fishes as typically belonging to the consensus list of reef fish families. So this used to be ten. Um, now we, uh, now I am treating uh, it as nine here. So that these uh, reef fish families have formed the backbone or the, the core of the different reef fish communities around the world, and as well as some taxa that you can only find in some certain reefs. For example, like endemic species or uh, families restricted to a certain um, ocean. So these are what we call uh, the coral reef fish communities. And if you look at the pictures that I have provided here, you can see that these reef fishes have astounding diversity, you know, not just taxonomic, uh, not just in uh, species diversity, but also if you look at the different colors, you look at the different uh, colors, body shapes, um, some species have different fin shapes, and so on and so forth. And this diversity, this high diversity of reef fishes uh, are a product of many um, events in deep time or many uh, past, uh, past events involving geological and paleo-oceanographic um, events. And so uh, with this timeline or that I modified from sales of coral reef fishes book, you can see that there are many events that have influenced the diversity and uh, diversity and distribution of reef fishes. So we, uh, so the first would be the, the disappearance of rudis reefs, you know, the rudis bivalves that make up these, uh, these um, reefs in the uh, near the uh, KT mass extinction event. And then a few years later uh, in the early, I you have seen. So the first coral, um, coral genus would arise and the first uh, acropora coral would arise. And it would only take a few million years. So that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of time. Okay, so I think I'm getting some connection issues. So uh, is everyone um, still here? Can I get some reactions? We're okay here. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So I think okay yung connection ko dito. So, so to continue, um, so again, uh, the, the first three fish families would arise uh, a few million years after the emergence of the first acropora. So just around um, 50 million years ago. And uh, subsequent events such as the uh, restriction of uh, the tropics but via the circumantarctic event, and the separation of the thetis into west and east thetis via the terminal thetan event. And eventually, the closure of Isthmus of Panama, dividing the tropics uh, into two, which is the Pacific and the Atlantic uh, uh, regions, would, would result in many uh, species being, uh, being divided, being, being isolated from each other, and eventually speciating into uh, to div to regionally distinct um, clades. And one particular uh, interesting group is the, the closure of the isthmus of Panama, you no know, connecting North and South America, but dividing many species um, 
and resulting in germinate pairs, sister pairs. Now, these are pair of species that are uh, that were that get the whose the divergence and their, their divergence can be explained by this closure of the isthmus of Panama. And then the Pleistocene, um, some major um, sea level changes would bring about a massive faunal turnover, extinction of reef fishes, especially those that are only that are restricted to a certain area, and accompanied by a massive reef area loss, in, but particularly in the Indo-West Pacific. So we are here in the Holocene. And that massive diversity in the Indo-Pacific reaches, reaches its maxima in the Coral Triangle. So this is a region in, uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific that is made up of the Philippines, Indonesia, Sabah, Papua New Guinea, and Solomon Islands. And reefs of that coral triangle uh, are only around 3% of the total surface area of the Indo-West and Central Pacific, so combined um, surface area. And despite um, having only 3% of that surface area, uh, 600, uh, 605 zootantelic coral species occur in the coral triangle. So that's around 75% of the world's total uh, number of coral species. And in terms of reef fishes, uh, the coral triangle is home to more than half of those that range uh, towards the Indian Pacific Ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean regions. So in that coral triangle, we can see the highest concentration or the most number of species uh, anywhere from the South Indonesia to Central Philippines. So it's a bit uh, within this area. And in 2005, no analysis of the geographic distribution of these um, marine faunal groups, and not just reef fishes, revealed the Philippines as a center of the center of marine shorefish diversity. So you maybe you've heard this before, and some similar terms would include um, center of the center of marine biodiversity or uh, center to center of uh, epicenters of uh, marine biodiversity. Those would roughly refer to the same um, same uh, insight that Carpenter and Springer found. And to visualize this easier in numbers, um, across a whopping 25,800 uh, square kilometers of reef area in the Philippines, so that's the estimation of BERT in 2002, we have approximately 1,800 reef fish species. So this makes us um, around uh, the third most species rich um, country in the Indo-West and Central Pacific. So take note, this is the Indo-West and the Central Pacific regions. And uh, are, are out of that 1,800, 29 of that um, are only found in the country. So you can see that these estimates are likely higher, especially with the rate that we are describing species from, not just from the Philippines in general, um, uh, but also at in neighboring areas. But why do we even study reef fishes? So that's that's um that's what somewhat that's what someone would ask me if I try if I tell them that I study reef fishes, right? So there's 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 so many reasons to study reef fishes. Um, first and foremost, we study them because they are part of our natural heritage, particularly our biodiversity, and especially uh, if are there if there are any taxa that are restricted to our country, restricted to certain portions of the Philippines, or if there are taxa in that can only uh, exist in certain um, environmental conditions. And as well as if there are any taxa that are being uh, threatened by different anthropogenic stressors like um, over extraction, uh, climate change and habitat degradation, of climate change or pollution. And we also study reef fishes because they are ecologically important. They are key players in our um, ecosystem where they play important roles in uh, enhancing resilience. For example, um, for a livery of feeding on coral tissue, um, or livery or feeding on algal matter, as well as uh, how biodiversity is uh, maintained and generated in these reefs, particularly by looking at community dynamics, as well as structure. And reef fishes are also important ecologically because they are um, key uh, players in the transfer of nutrients in reefs, particularly across different trophic levels. And not just ecological importance, we also study reef fishes because they are, uh, because they are uh, an important source of protein for many Filipinos you know, in the country. 
So this this image here shows that the different um, reef fish species being caught in a public wet market uh, in Bolinawa, Pangasinan. No, there's also a crab here you know, showing that uh, the different reef fishes that we often see underwater are also being consumed by coastal communities. So not just economic, not just ecologically important, not just uh, not, not just a part of our biodiversity, but also part of our food source and food security. And so we also study reef fishes so we can better manage them you know, via different um, <clears throat> policies and strategies like setting MPAs, um, setting appropriate fisheries policies like size limits. And so, the, so we, we, we have to remember the idea that these reef fishes are uh, very important, not just to nature, but also to us as part of our sustenance and survival. And so we look at the history of reef fish studies in the Philippines. So um, how did reef fish studies start? Right. Um, and the first, one of the first studies actually on reef fish, if involving reef fishes in the Philippines was done by Marun Dutse, where he described a, a, a variety of marine fishes and not just reef associated um, from, the, from the collections that he made in Manila Bay and some parts of Indonesia. Uh, during uh, a voyage from 1819 to 1820. So it involves many, uh, many species. Now, uh, for example, um, three species of puffers or botete and uh, some species of uh, triggerfish. And while he described these 20 species, the taxonomic validity of some species in his, uh, in his work you know, remain uncertain, especially since he did not uh, provide any type specimens that you know, um, many uh, future workers could use as a reference. So this was the first, at least first to our knowledge, uh, published work in Western literature about reef fishes. And so collections um, didn't stop there. No, uh, the collections continued you know, with Cuming's uh, collection of fishes for the British Museum, uh, Jaeger's uh, collection of samples that he gave to Wilhelm Peters in Berlin. And, Mayor's um, collections from Manila, Laguna, and Cebu that he gave to Albert Hunter to study and discard new species from. And it was only in 1885 that the first recorded attempt of a checklist, now a list that we can use for reference for uh, fishes in the Philippines, was published by Gurgoza E. Gonzalez in his Peces de las Islas Filipinas, which was only a three page, um, three page checklist. But he expanded on this list uh, later on, two years later, in his uh, Datos para la Pona Filipina, which is a 22-page list. So it grew from three to 22 pages. So almost a, de a decade later, you know, Father Castro de Elera uh, published the uh, Catalogo Systematico. So, so it has a long, has a very long name. So we just refer to it as a Catalogo Systematico, you know, which refers to uh, a collection of three volumes, which is about um, the different flora and fauna groups in the Philippines. So this is, was a major effort to catalog and the document the biodiversity of uh, Philippines during that time. And not just a catalog of biodiversity, you also made a catalog of collections that, uh, that were deposited and collected and deposited in the uh, UST, University of Santo Tomas a Museum of Natural History. So we now know it as a Museum of Arts and Sciences. And within that uh, three volumes of um, information, De Lera actually dedicated um, 168 pages you know, to different uh, freshwater and marine part of legends and bone fishes. And here are just some of the images of the fishes um, displayed uh, in the Museum of Arts and Sciences. So when I went there um, in 2019 to take some pictures and to, to visit the museum as well, so most of the collections that are being put on display mostly consist of taxidermid, bony and cartilaginous fishes, and as well as some um, non-fish, non-aquatic fish um, uh, specimens such as mammals, birds, um, shells, as well as these um, black coral and pipe coral specimens that are being uh, put on display. So there are more specimens that are not being uh, displayed, which are typically uh, pickled or wet collections that are uh, also deposited in the museum. So shortly after, um, after 1895, uh, in 1907 to 1910, the most extensive collection of reef fishes or marine fishes in the country 
would take place headed by the USS Albatross. So the USS Albatross, which uh, with the expedition being named as the USS Albatross Philippine Expedition, uh, conducted its longest and its most extensive collection in the Philippines. So collecting around 100,000 specimens uh, divided into 20,400 catalog uh, lots. So if you consider a lot to be a, uh, uh, a distinct species, so you can have a ballpark estimate of how many species they collected during that time. And around that 24,400 lots, uh, 1, 000, uh, almost 1,300 of them serve as type plots you know, that serve as a reference for species descriptions and other taxonomic work. And so when, it, when these specimens arrived in the Smithsonian, the USNM in 1910, it consisted around 40% of the entire collections. But, um, uh, but the estimate in 1999 by Swithin Williams currently placed these Albatross expedition specimens to around 7 to 8% of the current fishes collections in the museum. So much of the information that they collected were published in the bulletin of the US National Museum, consisting around five volumes uh, of published work. See, this is the USS Albatross, and this is one of uh, the illustrations, illustrations of, reef fish, uh, of fishes, marine fishes, that were collected during the trip. So you, can, you will hear a bit more about this guy who, who illustrated this uh, very steady fish. And when we say extensive, the, the USS Albatross expedition was extensive, extensive. Now, if you look at the routes provided by Smith and Williams, so you can see the different trips that the uh, Albatross did from 1908 to 1910. So you can see the different routes here. And you can see that um, the Albatross not just uh, not only made uh, several trips around the Philippines, it also made some excursions uh, towards Hong Kong, such as this one in 1908, and for its final route in uh, uh, in early January, you know, late late uh, 1909 to early 1910. So it also made some trips to Sulawesi and around this group of islands back to the Philippines, and so. Uh, Today, we often look at uh, the species described from different scientific, uh, scientific uh, works. You know, they're often being described using photographs or using uh, different uh, photographic methods. But the, way they, they, but the way the fishes from the USS Albatross expedition were, uh, were uh, visualized or, were, or uh, illustrated was by through color paintings. So color paintings were the the method of choice for this artist, Kumataro Ito, who made uh, these excellent illustrations of the different fishes spot during the Philippine expedition. So if you remember the fishes from the slide, the cover slide I made, uh, these, these are just uh, uh, some of the fishes out of a thousand, maybe only a hundred or so specimens were illustrated by uh, Kumataro Ito. So, after the Philippine expedition, uh, one of the mo uh, most notable collections and uh, efforts again in, in Philippine ichthyology, particularly in describing some reef fishes were done by uh, Albert Terry. So if you're familiar with Albert Terry, so he was the chief of the earth science and he is a very prolific taxonomist. So he described 234 species with uh, 88 of them currently considered as valid. And so one of his, uh, uh, biggest contributions to uh, Philippine ichthyology in general was the publication of uh, the checklist of Philippine fishes in 1953. So this details information from the different fishes, fishes that he collected uh, throughout the Philippines from 1920 to 1928. So this is, was a very extensive collection as well, spanning a longer period of time than the Albatross expedition. And details um, accounts of more than 2,100 species of fishes. And most of the species that he described, you know, Albert here described, was stored in uh, Bureau of Science Museum in the Philippines, or PSMP. You know, this is the institutional code. And so, uh, because here describes so many fishes, it, uh, and we're constrained for time, just, this is just a, a, a showcase of the different fishes that uh, Albert here um, described. You know, particularly those that are endemic to the Philippines. So he described um, 
at the, the world's only freshwater sardinella that I photographed. And, some, and these are just some of the uh, Thai specimens that he used to describe these species. And for example, the, this, this dotted back lepers and acceptable shadows, uh, this gobi and the gobius, and it's the blennis blenny. And then as well as some of these very colorful um, antias or antiadids, and the mantias tuca and the mantias this part. And so when I mentioned the Bureau of Science Museum earlier, right? So what is the Bureau of Science Museum? And how is it important to our knowledge of uh, fishes, particularly reef fishes? So the Bureau of Science Museum was actually established um, in 1933, which un under the Bureau of Science. Uh, under, uh, in 1939, it undergo a renaming to become the Natural History Museum Division. And just six years later, you know, World War II happened. And unfortunately, the Bureau of Science Museum, where the Bureau of Science building, where the museum is located, was destroyed. Ultimately, uh, and ultimately, this, the collections and specimens that were stored there, including here, this um, type specimens were presumed to have been destroyed. Although some, uh, some type specimens were fortunately um, stored uh, in other institutions, you know, such as the Cal Academy uh, and the Smithsonian. And so after the war, uh, it fused with the Finance Division of the National Library to become what we know now as the National Museum. And so looking at the previous works and previous um, collections that, we, that have been done in the Philippines, as well as the accompanying um, studies about them, about these fishes, most of uh, you'll notice that this is the case of fishes being brought to the scientists to be, stud to be studied, or uh, if fisher folk or uh, dedicated uh, methods would be used to collect these fishes and then brought to the scientists to study and name right? their new species. But with the advent of scuba diving, scuba is, um, scuba is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Now, the, the advent of scuba diving in the 1950s would bring um, etiology, particularly how we, the rate we name new species, the new heights. So as you can see from this graph by Eschmeyer, so you, there are five different peaks of high activity in the, in the rate of um, uh, the rate of we are describing new marine fishes. And the advent of scuba diving in the 1950s, the post 1950s, would, uh, would bring a significant increase in the number of uh, new taxa being described. So uh, along with the advent of scuba diving, um, it's also being accompanied by different uh, advances in technological um, in technology, such as in, uh, in, in particularly related to, to, to diving, as well as new collection methods that allow us to directly go into the field to observe and collect fishes. So again, rather than fishes being brought to the labs to study, which was the almost, which was almost the sole um, way that ichthyologists in the um, and in earlier works have been able to collect and to describe and, and document reef fishes. You know, we can now, you know, ichthyologists are now able to go underwater to directly observe and collect reef, uh, fishes, and particularly reef fishes. And today, you know, up, uh, until today, uh, you know, open circuit scuba diving, such as this one that I'm using to survey reef fishes in Southern Leyte, is one of the most common methods to study reef fishes. And, uh, just like the accompanying um, advances in technology, you know, we, now, we also now have um, a different uh, diving setups that allow us to go deeper, you know, such as uh, this, uh, this rebreather setup, a rebreather diving setup that allows um, ichthyologists to go to uh, more than 100 meters to collect and survey the fishes. And looking back, uh, and looking back, we can see that the Philippines has um, a lot of collections done during the 1900, 1900 to 1999. And if, uh, if, if you're looking at these um, families, the five families alone, you can see that these extension, uh, this, this, these collections are quite extensive in nature. So these past collections represent a important archives of life, representing not just the species itself, but also the environmental conditions that were uh, that were that 
these fishes lived in during that time. And so with the advent of scuba diving enabling us to, to uh, study reef fishes in situ, so we can now directly dive and go explore our reefs. And in 1976, like the UP Marine Sciences Center and the Siliman University, you know, they did a national uh, survey of reefs in uh, many areas of the country, particularly in Luzon, uh, Palawan, and Western Central Visayas. And out of those uh, areas they surveyed, so more than 95% of them didn't have a 75% or greater than 75% coral cover. So most areas only had, I think, around half, uh, no, less than 50% um, coral cover. And so oddly enough, um, Alcala and Gomez uh, didn't report on any um, reef fish surveys that that may, they, that, that may that they may have done during the survey. And so most of what we know about reef fishes you know, during the 1970s and 1990s were mostly um, about uh, fisheries, and particularly um, uh, the fish yields you know, coming from coral reefs. And you can see this table from Alcala and Chavez's um, estimation of uh, fish yields in Apo Island. You can see that many of these fishes and many of these uh, families are actually reef associated. And some of them, some of them belong to the consensus list that we meant that, uh, that we learned about earlier. And so you can see that reef fishes provide a lot you know, in terms of, in terms of uh, productivity. And that, that would easily translate to, to a significant protein source, particularly for those uh, living in coastal communities. And in 19, um, and in 1988, uh, national scientist uh, uh, Angel Alcala uh, reviewed marine research in the Philippines. So this was one of the first images of Philippine reefs that I could find in a scientific publication. So this was in 1988. So he observed that uh, protection does work for reef fish communities. So, so setting up protection via marine research does work for reef fish communities, but you can only see effects at around a decade, a decade's worth of protection. And so most of the reef fish communities that they surveyed also reflect that uh, most of these uh, consensus list reef fish families don't just uh, make up a majority of the total species composition in terms of diversity, but they're also very abundant. You can see in this uh, graph here, that is from Sumilan, Apo, and Balikasari Island. Uh, stations. And because uh, we know, we, we now know that uh, protection does have a positive impact on reef fish communities, especially if you can, if you, if you protect reefs for more than 10 years, uh, Alcala and Russ uh, observed and provide uh, evidence in the Philippines about the spillover effect. So the spillover effect is, we would refer to the, um, to, to, uh, the increase in uh, increase in, for example, biomass and abundance of reef fishes, you know, adjacent, you know, very adjacent uh, areas, you know, adjacent to uh, marine reserves, and this this was later corroborated by field data or in situ data. You know, this is uh, making it consistent with their observations that uh, maintain, maintaining protection doesn't just protect doesn't just benefit the reserve itself. Right? It benefits other areas that are being fished. Uh, that are being uh, fished by pressure pool. So we then turn to biogeography, which is a very interesting field of study for me, which, uh, which in 1994, Alinho and Gomez and Alinho uh, 1994, they, uh, they proposed six marine biogeographic regions you know, these, that would explain um, a variation in community composition of many reef associated organisms, you know, not just reef fishes. So these, uh, these marine biogeographic regions, as shown here, you know, reflect these different um, different uh, areas throughout the country, where uh, where you could, you could you, where you will um, uh, you will notice a differential uh, with differential uh, community composition, and these areas are represented by red lines indicating uh, the demarcation between these regions. Are, uh, are, being, are being characterized by broad transition or your broad changes and gradual changes in terms of reef fish composition, community composition. And so after, um, the, after 
the 1990s. So we then turn to uh, 2000 in order and to the present, where we look at the recent trends uh, in Philippine reef fish research. So, uh, and so we first look at biodiversity in ecology. So this is just uh, a hand-picked selection of, of the different um, biodiversity and ecology related um, studies that have been put out in the past two decades. As you can see that there are some uh, studies about ecology, some uh, would be, be about uh, biodiversity in general, uh, some would be you know, providing uh, species specific uh, level of information uh, showing that we are uh, looking at a lot of, of areas of study you know, as, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, the current trends in research. And most of that observation, you know, some of, uh, a snapshot of those observations would be uh, that most of our recent efforts look at community surveys across various scales. You now you can see many studies would be about um, nationwide surveys, um, a survey at a certain area, local MPAs, or some would be about surveying a certain region, for example, like Sulu Sea or uh, a certain um, island. However, the, most of these studies, most of these community surveys are only, uh, were only done once. You know, these, um, in, in many cases, only done as a baseline, baseline uh, assessment. And while these are very important, you know, very important to, in terms of providing us with information about reef fish communities, these are, this would offer us only a snapshot of biodiversity. And, in, and if you want to monitor reef fish communities you know, and core reefs in general, that information, monitoring information is very critical to, to, to make to making uh, science driven or science based uh, actions. And yet, and yes, baseline surveys are still important, particularly for areas that uh, under, are understudied or unexplored, or relatively unexplored. And so we also have noticed that reef fish communities, but uh, in general, uh, are influenced more by changes in habitat conditions. So this is more of a bottom-up control, you know, where, where, where the substrate controls the, the uh, structure of reef fish communities, you know, rather than fishing, which uh, recent, just, just recently were, uh, were seen to have a somewhat more minor effect in, in community structure. However, it's also important to, to remember that uh, these uh, these uh, conditions do not exist in a um, in a vacuum. Particularly, if you if you fail to mitigate uh, threats, for example, um, over extraction, over fishing, uh, and uh, habitat degradation brought about by climate change and warming sea temperatures, so these can compound and further degrade community composition. So, so that's so that's something to keep in mind. And we've also been um, learning about the importance of non coral reef habitats. So, for example, um, macroalgal beds, um, soft sediment habitats, and as well as, uh, as, well as um, uh, seagrass areas and mangrove areas that are perceived to, uh, to, to be important uh, as well as coral reefs in maintaining biodiversity, especially if they exist as a mosaic, uh, somewhat of a halo halo scenario especially in maintaining biodiversity and providing us with uh, critical ecosystem goods and services. And in terms of marine biogeographic regions, as we've learned earlier from uh, Alinho and Gomez and Alinho's uh, you know, proposal of these uh, six marine bioregions, they would explain some variation in community composition, but uh, this is an interesting field of study that would need further examination to, to look at if there are any taxon specific patterns you know, that, will, that would be explained by these uh, demarcations. And um, although this is mostly a cursory search, I've been noticing that there are fewer um, shorter natural history papers. Uh, this would be um, short papers and de detailing a certain peculiar ecology, uh, a new record, for example, or um, shorter papers in general that would describe, um, that would offer critical information about reef fish ecology and our biodiversity. So I've been seeing that in the case for reef fishes, 
it doesn't seem to be as many as, for example, if you look at um, lepidopterans, uh, lepidopterans or plants. So uh, short natural histories are generally fewer, at least for leaf fishes in the present, but they still remain as, as, as valuable. And so because there's a lot of ecology-related information to parse or to, to digest, uh, uh, one of my mentors in leafage ecology, uh, Dr. Rene Abisami, I think uh, he's also with us right now. So he is uh, also presenting a similar talk, um, focusing more on the ecology side. So if you're interested in, in learning about leafage ecology, so uh, Dr. Rene Abisami is, is presenting a very somewhat similar title, but a very uh, st still very distinct um, presentation on the 25th. So, for if you're interested, um, yeah, so please join. And so we, we delve a bit from, from that uh, biodiversity and ecology to look at mesophotic coral ecosystems in general. So these are uh, coral ecosystems or reefal ecosystems that are often situated in very deep portions of water, not, not thousands of meters deep, but uh, deep beyond the, the um, limits of recreational diving. And so these mesophotic coral ecosystems are very distinct in terms of the, the fishes and different uh, reef associated organisms that live in those areas, but they're equally threatened by similar stressors. So that, that's what uh, workers are seeing or what researchers are seeing now that they're equally being threatened by similar stressors and such as overfishing, um, climate change. And most of the studies being done in the country mostly involve uh, video systems such as uh, BRAVs or baited remote underwater video systems and scientific rebreather diving. So the, these are methods that are more suited to, uh, to, to looking at deeper portions of or the deeper reefs in the country. However, many MCEs in the country are, are, are largely explored. So as you can see from this selection, the most of them have been done in the central Philippines, um, so there's also one from the Benham Bank, uh, Philippine rice, and uh, some areas in the country. And so collections still remain important just as, just as, just as it was in the, uh, 18, uh, the 1700s, 1800s, and uh, 1900s. They are still as important as they are then. Uh, and most of these um, collections have involved many trips to the Mindoro Island, um, expeditions by the Kala Academy of Sciences in the Birdie Island Passage in 2011, 2014, um, market collections uh, and Panay Island collections by UP Visayas and Kagoshima University, um, and as well as some ongoing projects that are being done in the country right now, you know, such as the Philippines Fire Project and um, some barcoding projects, like barcoding projects that have been done and currently being uh, carried out by the UP Mindanao team. And so collections are, collections are very important because we are still describing, or even in, in the um, 21st century, we are still describing new species, new species of fishes you know, from, from market samples, such as this Acanturus albimento and Celtoperca santosa. So these are just some of the species described from the market survey collections that were done and Hopefully, current other projects would would uh, would yield similar uh, you know, similar results. And in terms of and uh, and uh, there's a new species. We still keep new seeing new species that are uh, new to Western science that are being collected from the country. So this is just a, a handful of species that have been described in the past two decades. So you see that they come in different. Um, different families and different uh, shapes and colors. Now, testing to the, to the high diversity of fishes and particularly those associated with uh, coral reefs in the country. So there's, there's, there's many that have been described and there's still many more to be described. And more than descriptions of new species, we could also, uh, we, we are also seeing, so, uh, we are also seeing that there is also still a need to re-describe no, species, that, especially those that are poorly known, such as the case for Labrasinus atrofasciatus that I worked on with uh, Tony Gill, uh, Victor Brun, and uh, Yikaiti. No, we we re-described this 
Northern Palawan Endemic Totiba to provide information, more morphological information, and uh, and to describe for the first time the live coloration of males. So these are males of this species. So yeah. So so re re description also is also um, still important, and then we still mo need more. Um, appraisals, uh, as, as you see in, in, the, in the last section. And so in terms of fisheries and conservation, so we, st we, we still, uh, we're still we, we are working on um, many areas, you know, involving uh, fisheries and conservation, such as looking at connectivity, looking at whether, you know, Philippine uh, marine research and nationally management research are effective in, uh, in, effective in uh, improving. You know, coral reef fish communities, as well as um, um, providing you know, uh, conservation uh, work, such as the um, Icin Red List for marine endemic helios or bony fishes of the Philippines. So there's still, there, we are doing uh, a wide variety of studies pertaining to our fisheries and conservation. But we ask ourselves, we, we have a plethora of studies in the past, we have a, 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 a plethora of studies in the present about reef fishes, and we know so much, so much more uh, about reef fishes now. Uh, but we ask ourselves, where do we swim to un, unintended? Where, where, where do we move forward to? And what are the avenues for future research efforts? And one of those research efforts that we can, be, uh, we can work on, at, at least in, uh, in a broader scale, is establishing a rigorous and standardized monitoring system for uh, reefs in the country. So uh, I, I read about the um, status of the coral reefs of the world. So this is a very big report uh, detailing uh, the, the current state of coral reefs in the world. And the Philippines is in the sub-region one in the East Asian seas. So you can see there's a lot of observations, uh, 11,000, but if you look at the number of sites being monitored for more than 15 years, we don't, it, we don't seem to have any information for that. And that's uh, quite worrying. You know, we don't have any long-term information, uh, especially, if we want to, especially if we want to look at standardized monitoring to capture shifting baselines. So if you look at this map, you know, the Philippines mostly has this yellow, um, lime and then green points that represent about 10 or less than 10 years worth of information. Save for Apo Island here, I can see the pointer of my mouse. So I think that's the only um, area in the Philippines, so along with Tubataha, that are getting um, long-term monitoring information, consistent long-term monitoring information. And so this is very important, especially if we want to know um, if our reef fish communities are, are, are shifting uh, are shifting in terms of uh, diversity, abundance, or biomass. And, then, and uh, if we want to draft, you know, draft appropriate um, actions or policies to, to uh, mitigate those uh, shifting baselines and to, to prevent um, shifting baselines from progressing uh, into worse outcomes, we need to have a standardized monitoring system. That's for biodiversity inequality. And next, we uh, and next, as I mentioned in, in the collection section of the previous um, previous area of um, the presentation, collections are still important today and in the future. Now, this would involve reappraising um, what has been collected from the Philippines, what is being collected right now, to assess how many fish species do we actually have. You know, how many uh, are considered valid? How many? Um, how many are poorly known and would need further taxonomic work to do. And this would be tied into a similar uh, vein, of, uh, vein of area later that relies on the streamlining of scientific processes in the Philippines, particularly with obtaining permits. If you're a marine uh, scientist in the Philippines and you want to collect uh, material for your study, so you might find yourself in a bit of uh, back and forth, especially if, uh, uh, it taking longer times to get a simple permit. So, so that streamlining of scientific permitting process would greatly help 
the future collections in the country. And uh, in not just streamlining go uh, government processes, we also need institutional support for continued collections, especially if we want to do collections and collections-based research. This is very critical if we want to document and monitor our biodiversity and to also expand our, 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 um, our toolbox to include genetic tools to, uh, to, augment, you know, to augment collection uh, collections. That would also improve uh, collections by establishing collaborative networks between uh, universities and local and foreign natural history museums. And so last week, a paper about a major biodiversity and natural history collection came out um, where NAGS in that paper stated that um, you know, if, 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 we, if our biodiversity is not degrading, it's easy to, to, to disregard collections, especially future collections. But we must recognize that we are uh, experiencing a, an extinction, uh, experiencing a, uh, a disappearance of, of, our, of our biodiversity worldwide. So we need to build new collections, not just for future research, but also to, to safeguard and restore you know, a, a biodiverse world. So that's from NAGS, uh, from the paper uh, by NAGS. And so we also go deeper in future uh, research efforts to cover mesophotic or ecosystems. So uh, this would mean higher uh, coverage of MCEs in the country, especially uh, if we do surveys. You know, this would be ecological surveys that is coupled with collections. So you don't just uh, drop into a reef, uh, drop into a mesophotic uh, reef, and then you go back up. So it needs to be coupled with collections, which is especially important if we want to document not just the taxonomy and systematics of reef associated organisms there, but also life history traits. Since we don't know much about these, um, these species and particularly if they are restricted to these ecosystems, you know, these this, this, this collections would prove invaluable for knowing the life history traits of different um, reef fishes in the, in the mesophotic. And, and doing surveys would also entail providing the, um, important technical and uh, CCR, closed circuit rebreather diving training to current and future research researchers. And so I mentioned um, taxonomic, uh, taxonomy earlier in the collections portion. And so in taxonomy systematics, again, it's closely tied with, with, the, with collections because it, relied, it relies on continued support, institutional support of natural history museums and museum workers, not just current museum workers, but also um, upcoming and future research, uh, researchers you know, interested in working in natural history museums. So this would, in, uh, so feature um, avenues would involve description of new species and a continuous description of new species, um, redescription of species that are poorly known, or in the case of the Bureau of Science Museum, um, holotypes you know, with no other type specimens stored elsewhere, you know, establishing new types for some species and involving an integrative approach, a multi-pronged approach to, to, to describing and delimiting species, um, either use, using phylogenetics, uh, phylogeo phylogeography, and comparative morphology. Especially since we are experiencing a taxonomic impediment, you know, we, lack a lot, you know, we lack a lot of um, taxonomic manpower in to, uh, air quotes. Um, so in order for taxonomy and systematics so, uh, to, to move forward in the Philippines, so we need, uh, we need more uh, institutional support, we need more workers. You know, I'm, I'm just a novice taxonomist myself. So I, I, as, as a newbie in, in this field, it's quite um, very concerning to see. So we, we need more uh, workers on taxonomy and systematics of the fishes. And so there's still so much more. You don't have to confine yourself if you're interested in, in looking at reef fishes. You can study so much more um, areas of study, uh, which involves many of uh, this list. For example, if you want to look at very tiny cryptobentic reef fishes, um, if you want to look at offshore reefs, you know, this, uh, it's like in Calayan Island Group or ben, uh, Philippine Rice or Hito Mataha, you might be interested. Um, if you're interested in conservation, then you might be interested in looking at radius assessments, um, protection effects and effectivity, 
So there's so much more to, to study about bee fishes that it's seemingly endless. And, and as, as a popular saying or Bible verse goes, and the, the, the harvest is plenty and the, but the workers are few. And that seems to be the case for um, bee, fish, uh, bee fish workers in the Philippines. So there's, we still need more uh, scientists working on bee fishes. And if we need more scientists, we need to change how we do science, particularly by changing and improving our sciences done in the country because it affects the current and future reef fish research as well as researchers. So that would mean um, better infrastructure support and better working conditions for current and emerging workers and researchers. Uh, that would mean ending contractualization, creating permanent positions so that people who receive training for these specific um, reef fish related areas don't just um, go elsewhere and, and find a new job because they're discouraged by the lack of um, permanent positions in, in, in different institutions. And as well as in for improving procurement process because um, most of the delays, you know, most of delays that would be attributed to these procurement processes would be great. Would, uh, if, if these, you know, if these uh, long waiting times are removed, you no know, science would, uh, would move faster, move forward faster. And we also need to, to recognize that the involvement and leadership of communities in doing scientific research, particularly um, if uh, particularly by communities leading studies, you know, using uh, involving local ecological knowledge, and by using power of citizen science in providing uh, in, in in linking scientists with the general public. And speaking of public, we also need to improve public perce perception of areas of sciences that are seen as basic. You know, uh, basic and often disregarded, but are still very crucial to what we know about to, to, to understand and further um, to further uh, research you know, G-fish communities and such as natural history, uh, taxonomy, and systematics. And that would mean uh, investing uh, you know, more than uh, you know, not, uh, beyond uh, providing institutional support, but also investing in science communication and science communicators and recognizing natural history museums and not just buildings with pretty exhibits of different plants and animals, but as uh, uh, key players in research and public outreach. So we need to change how we do science so at many levels. So these are just some ways that we can uh, move forward. And so it's a very long talk. I, 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 you might be, uh, might be tired of listening to me, so just to, to just wrap, wrap up this, um, this presentation, so let me provide a summary, of basically a TLDR of the past 50 minutes of uh, information. So we know that the reef fish science in, in, uh, in the Philippines and in our country is very rich. You know, across two centuries, we have a lot of information and we've learned so much from that information, but there's still so much more left to learn. There's just so much more to study. And we know, and, and when we know that uh, reef fish communities are crucial members of Philippine biodiversity, and uh, the, their ecological uh, and economic importance uh, signals the need for continued and more diverse studies, especially if we want to understand and conserve them. And the future of reef fish science and the future of where we are swimming to stands on the shoulders of giants or Goliath groupers, if you want to uh, punify it. To enhance our scientific strengths, uh, support more areas, so a, a wider diversity of, uh, of, of, of studies, and to improve how we do science in the country. So it's quite a long presentation, but thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions or comments, I really appreciate them. If you can uh, ask them now, if, uh, if, if you're shy, uh, sh shy type, um, you can send them and you can, you can send me an email at uh, this in here. So just some acknowledgements. Um, uh, the Aquatic Zoology Research Lab. So uh, Dr. Victor Tixon, Nam Elma, Ewan G. Gibel, Pet A, and then um, Mabel Fortales and Dr. Nea Abisamis for uh, giving, um, giving important information about their current um, ongoing work. So salamat po. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Kent, uh, for that outstanding presentation. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Again, to all our uh, participants, we have 128 participants here. If you would like to, uh, to ask 
our speaker, uh, Kent, uh, some of questions, please uh, put them in the chat box so that our uh, guest moderator will be able to read them and uh, uh, for, for Kent. But before I turn you over to our um, to Christian Lucanias, uh, may rule lang akong simple questions. Kent, uh, first, hindi ko kasi na nakache, eh, pero I, I'm kind of curious, dun sa reef fishes, uh, let's say, how many percent of them are actually edible? Mer uh. um, that's a very interesting question. Oh, di ba? Kasi uh, usually, yung ating ano, lagi tayo nasa deep sea, ang yun ang uh, hinuhuli, kinakain. Pero bigla ko naisip eh. Di ba, napakalaki ng reef fish uh, communities. Uh, I think it's uh, it's going to be an untapped resource or probably it's, it's not a resource not uh, yet to be tapped. No? Pero bigla ko na curious, ano, ilan percentage, percentage kaya ng mga yun ang pwede actually maging uh, you know, safe for consumption? Okay. So, so, very interesting question, hmm. sir. For actually, uh, maybe napagana yung brain cell ko dun. Pero, uh, to answer your question, um, a lot of big fishes are actually edible. No? So, oh. kung, uh, if, you, if you go to a public wet market, especially kapag if it's if it's near a coral reef, you know, you, you'll typically see many, a wide array of big fishes no? if, from as small as uh, as this, the tiny headphones case, no? around five inches or larger, no? typically uh, they're, they're being consumed as food fish. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in terms of uh, the percentage, if you refer to taxonomic uh, diversity of fishes being um, consumed, um, this, it's difficult to come up with an actual number, but madame is it's Marami. a lot. A lot of a lot of free fishes are being consumed. No, the, the important resource talaga siya for our coastal, coastal communities. Yeah, maganda rin siguro later on to para quantify. No, kasi let's say they, they could be eaten, but uh, yung loss. Some some loss may, may prevent you know uh, for consuming them. No? Sa pang uh, things to be considered pagdating to. Yeah, I I I tama kay sir for actually may may there merong, uh, there's this weird fiasco that I've been uh, participating <laughs> or I, mm -hmm. I was uh, talking about with my mm -hmm. fellow um, refish workers about this about parrotfish. Now, you, you you might have seen. Oh um, uh, yeah, yeah. Post Ito. about parrotfish in Facebook, like uh, or don't catch or sell them. But a lot of these um, parrotfish related information aren't really backed by science. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, if 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 we want to talk, if we want to set um, these um, you know regulations for catching reef fish, we don't just have to think uh, uh, of generalized information. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you also have to think um, the data that we currently have and how it would affect coastal communities and when yung mga fisher folk nan that would rely on these for their survival. So true. It's 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 weird. It's medyo ano. Okay. Medyo ano lang siya. Uh, and uh, my last question along I ano ba? Um, you mentioned about deep sea uh, diving research, no? <coughs> yung mga areas na uh, um, just curious kung without the help or scientific assistance of uh, let's say other countries who have the you know, the machines the, the, sh the ships or the unmanned uh, big uh, what it calls unmanned uh, underwater vehicles or something like that uh, do you think kaya yan kaya natin yan sa Pilipinas on our own Very tricky question. Uh, since, since in the past we mostly relied on uh, other countries on visiting and studying our fishes, um, it we have capacity to conduct our own. Actually, uh, uh, since the advent of scuba diving, you know, there are many um, local led or local uh, surveys. I mean, beyond the mana published, beyond published information, uh, there are many groups you know, that have conducted and currently conducting. Um, refresh assessment so using their own uh, capacity so at present i believe we have uh we are capable we just need we just need more 
um, we just need more support support like, yeah, from from the government and yeah, institutional support all right thank you kent uh let me now turn you over to uh christian uh, christian lucanias is one of our junior entomologists and uh, I've invited him to serve as moderator kasi ano siya, uh, freshwater. Um, he likes freshwater fishes, no? <laughs> other than uh, uh, other arthropods, no? So, uh, Christian, uh, t- please take the floor. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, I'm here to serve as moderator for the talk. So, uh, we have uh, several questions in the chat box. So uh, one is from Mr. Francis Verdadero. So he wants to ask if uh, you would know how many reef fish taxonomists or systematists are there in the Philippines. Uh, uh, thank you, Christian, for relaying the question. Hi, birds. Um, the total number of within you know, that's that's a very um, Interesting question since I still need to confirm kung ilan. But um, if, if you've seen some papers of, uh, mostly done by Jeff Williams, Ken Carpenter, and there's a lot of workers working on a lot of uh, workers working on uh, research taxonomy and systematics from samples collected from the Philippines. But um, local taxonomists, I only know some you know, some interested um interested and no, uh, still novice taxonomy such as myself no, it it i'll have to get back to you but i i will need to estimate kung ilan sila so i hope it it answers somewhat the question birds okay, thank you uh ken so uh, our next question came from juvi reyes so uh he or she and wants to ask if uh, uh, regarding the animal fish uh, so are they included as reef fish at yung kung meron daw pong conservation plants para sa kanila uh, yeah hi juvi thank you for your question um yeah we we, we consider anemone fishes as reef fishes and most of the anemones that we live in um are are uh, occurring in coral reefs, no, and si Sinimo, the very typical um, anemone fish, a very popular anemone fish, you no, know, lives in um, coral uh, anemones found in coral reefs. So, yes, they are reef fishes. And if you're asking if our, if we are, yeah, if we have any conservation plants, I think um, there's uh, some general um, policies by BIFAR on um, taking anemone fishes. Uh, without uh, so you need a permit to do that so if especially if, you, if you're trying to to export to other countries na may mga aquaries na uh, market um, and we also um, uh, conservation plants and and uh, in terms of conservation may mga, there, there are species that are being bred uh, especially for if if you, if you try to look up online ma different color morphs or color variations na anemone fish. So it's, it's, it's somewhat of a way to um, to, to, to develop a, a way to breed, uh, to, to uh, captive breed these anemone fish. Pero yeah, these are somewhat very general conservation plants. So yun for anemone fish. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, okay, Ara, I have the next question. Uh, so, I was wondering how how marine fishes become endemic. No? Uh, because you see, uh, of course, you, you can see the ocean here. I mean, they're interconnected and some sort of that. So it would be hard or at least very, uh, how do you say, interesting to know how how these reef fishes uh, become endemic. No? Why don't they uh, disperse or uh, move from one area to another? Um, yeah, uh, very interesting question, yun, uh, Christian. Because uh, in 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 marine biogeography, there there are there's not a lot of um, I mean, there's not a lot of there, there are soft barriers that would restrict uh, populations, you know, that, that would eventually lead to 
to isolation and then uh, further diversion to end species. Um, for, for marine fishes, particularly for reef fishes, um, how species become endemic is, uh, is produced uh, is, is a product of different um, oceanographic um, processes. You know, for example, in the case of um, Narbacinus atropashatus, you know, the, the, the northern Palawan endemic that we, descri uh, we described last year, um, we still haven't uh, properly tested uh, how it came to be isolated or to be endemic to northern Palawan. But one explanation might be um, the, the rise and fall of sea level during the Pleistocene, or you have, rise, uh, you have sea levels of fluctuating going uh, up you know, in, in one period of time and going really, really, uh, and then this, uh, decreasing quickly uh, in, in the next. So these um, paleoceanographic processes and these resulting um, uh, processes that brought about these environmental conditions might have resulted in isolating a population of the, the, the ancestor of this uh, endemic dotibat in northern Palawan. And then uh, when it was actually isolate, isolated, uh, the, 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 the um, environmental conditions you know, after these um, Pleistocene glacial uh, events might have resulted in uh, them being locked out by a somewhat soft barrier in, in, in this portion of the country. So it's, it's uh, the answer might be taxon specific, in some cases, feature specific. But uh, yeah, the, the, in, in most cases, it would involve you know, um, soft barriers such as deep waters and uh, you know, uh, sea level changes. Uh, just the follow up, well, major related, you know, then, uh, so in terms of, so of course, we have your endemic fish. Yeah. So does this give uh, rise or why, why are there so many uh, or, or diverse reef fishes in the Philippines and in, in, in the coral triangle in general? Um, there's a number of hypotheses explaining bucket or why we have a lot of reef fishes in this portion of the world, this very small portion of the world. And then you have so many reef fish, um, reef fish species that only occur in this area. You can, you, and you will never find them if you, for example, go to uh, Florida, if you dive in Florida, or if you dive in um, Eastern Pacific, or in Atlantic, or in the Mediterranean. There's actually a, a number of hypotheses um, would uh, prefer to, uh, that would explain the high diversity so that would be a, a center of origin, you know, that, that such that um, a speciation of uh, a speciation occurs, um, a speciation um, is highest in the Indo-Pacific, and then as you go um, away from that area, it becomes less. So we we hypothesis that that hypothesis you know, just presumes that uh, the, the the origin or the origin of the diversity that you see in areas away from the coral triangle. Uh, is is a product of you know, species being um, distributed or dispersed away from the so I'm, I'm that uh, that is one so it might be that accumulation of species you know, brought about by different dispersal events from different areas just outside the coral triangle so kind of like accumulate you know, according mm -hmm. to the uh, according to the um, accumulation theory. And then there are refuge. So young coral reefs in the Indo-Pacific might or in the coral triangle might have served as refugia, para shelter for these reef fish species in uh, in times na parang uh, in general habitat conditions in areas elsewhere are not suitable or not habitable for these uh, taxon. So we're gonna isolate an uh, isolate and species taking refuge, and then that will explain the uh, current uh, diversity. So th th those are uh, three. So the answer, the, the definite answer is still um, taxon, oops, taxon uh, specific. So, but those are just some of the main explanations. Thank, uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Abisamis, uh, your mentor. So he, Hi, he said that uh, he agrees with you in revisiting the marine biogeographic regions. So, uh, but his question is, what are your thoughts about improving work in this area? So do you suspect greater partitioning, uh, particularly in the Visayas region, or partitioning based on coral reef ecology? 
Hi, sir. Very, very uh, interesting question. A very um, important question. Uh, since uh, I think most of the work that would that would build on improving yung what we know about uh, new fish communities in the country would I think would be uh, a, a a somewhat integrative involving you know, yung what we know to in situ surveys and then what we know to our collections are somewhat integrating uh, this into to in, and looking at whether some species do seem to disappear in surveys but are present in collections or vice versa. Um, uh, that's one way to, to improve our, our, our work on, on that area of marine geography in the country. Um, and in terms of partitioning, uh, we, well, based from current um, biodiversity you know, data about by our, our diversity, uh, yeah, we would expect a greater number of, uh, of a greater partitioning, uh, partitioning uh, within the Central Philippines since uh, that, uh, since, um, Sorry, um, since uh, the, since, since um, some oceanographic processes would, would ultimately limit uh, dispersal of, of uh, some species, particularly if, if, if their life history if their uh, life history traits and involve limited dispersal. Uh, yeah, it, I guess it would be um, more of being influenced uh, within uh, being uh, influenced. Uh, within those with uh, region-based you know, partitioning rather than type, uh, reef typology, but we still need to verify if that is the case. I hope I answered a bit of that question, sir. Um, but yeah, um, we still need to, to, to further look into that. Yeah, uh, it is a very interesting uh, work, especially in biogeography. Uh, of course, in, in, in the terrestrial counterpart, you also have the same uh, general Pleistocene island complex. But within those complexes, you, there are still subdivisions. So, so I do expect that we, that the marine biogeographics would still be subdivided further. Uh, okay, we have a question from Mr. Stephen Duke. So he wants to inquire if there are any online database system regarding uh, reef collection, uh, fish collections, uh, or do they or do we still need to go to fish base, GB or any foreign museums for for such uh, database? Um, Stephen, thank you for your question. Um, I would need to ask that the National Museum if. Uh, for that, since yeah, similar to uh, what I'm doing for my thesis now involves uh, natural history museum collections. So I'm doing a similar way to access information uh, for fishes in general, especially as a group. <coughs> but uh, yeah, I think um, <coughs> I think I'll still need to ask National Museum um, regarding that. So um, update updating. Uh, I do think that uh, each museums would have their, well, at least most museums would have their own database of the specimens that, that are present in their collections. Although for some, uh, they are still working on it. Or, hmm. uh, well, there. I don't. Well, in general, uh, I don't think there's any uh, uh, large online database for for specimens. Uh, overall, I do think you still have to ask whether uh, their particular museum have it mm. or something. But it would, yeah. would be a very interesting uh, uh, project or idea to work on. Uh, but it would take a lot, a lot of work. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, uh, just for, for, uh, for Stephen's information, and if you're interested in looking at um, you know, Philippine uh, collections, or especially for museums abroad, um, I think Bio is a great resource for accessing your collection information for uh, for uh, not just species and very general um, natural history collections in general um, located in the in museums in the US. So if you're interested, um, yeah, you can go to I think Bio, very great resource as well. 
uh, just a follow up uh, with pertains to uh, specimens or museum specimens. Do you, do you know where majority or which museum, at least locally, have the majority of the specimens in terms of reef fish? Uh, Uh, that would be the National Museum. I think um, the current estimate nila ng lots, at least for, I think it was for fish, and so one, no, one million lots for, for just for fishes alone. I, um, the museum files, please correct me if I'm wrong. Baka in, pero yun yung huli kong tanda. The most of our collections are, are in uh, the National Museum sa Manila. Ah, that, that's it's interesting. I think uh, our uh, the UPLD I mean, should start rebuilding the, the fish farm. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> there's. I mentioned. No, I, did, I, mentioned right. I, I mentioned. K K Sir Floor one time that that no I I have some samples already in the lab that are waiting to be deposited in the museum. So I, so I I. Mag, may dadating. May, mad, may dadating din na mga samples sa MNH as well. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so because for the longest time, I think uh, medyo uh, stuck. So hindi na masyadong nadagdagan yung fish collections and you see. So uh, I think it, it, your donations would be very much appreciated. No? So uh, there's also a question from Miss Mitchell Malay. So she or she ba ito? So sorry. Uh, wants to ask if kung uh, saan daw ba located ang mga reef, reef fish endemic sa Philippines? So kung meron bang particular regions or, or reef yung mataas yung endemicity? Um, yeah, Ma'am Michelle, thank you for the question. Um, more, uh, uh, a region that we're looking at, particularly for reef fish endemics in the Philippines, uh, isa sa mga areas no, most yung parang concent highest concentration siguro ng, ng endemic species is in northern Palawan. So that's the area from Taytay, anywhere from Taytay to El Nido, northwards to the Calamianes. So that's, that's, that's what we're, we're, we're hypothesizing or we're, uh, we are thinking uh, na doon pinakamataas that area is the highest number of marine endemic species in the country because um, I think just for damsel fish alone, meron na silang, they, we already have three endemic, one endemic genus and three endemic species so in that area alone. So, yun, Northern Palawan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, maganda po, uh, that, that would be a good avenue to explore you know, dispersal barriers, particularly if, if Pleistocene glacial maxima had any hand in 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 um isolating those species but yes um yeah um that would be an interesting thing to for the expert okay uh thank you uh ken i think i will ask the last question so of course we we have mentioned that we have a very high uh, uh endemicity percent endemicity of reef fish in the country so but uh, how many or of them are currently uh, facing uh, threats that would lead to them being uh, extinct or uh, endangered in the near future? So I think that, that would be my last question. Um, that would be, I mean, the, the answer is quite complicated since one, we lack you no know, important um, information for these endemic species that are needed uh, in making formal assessments like the ICN red list. So for, for many endemics, we don't even know population trends, like how many species, uh, how many individuals are currently there and if are there any declines or uh, this uh, biogeographic um, distribution or the range nila. We're still being, up, we're still updating for many taxa uh, this this information and um, yeah since some endemics you know like yung like the labrasinus atrapasatus that we rediscribe is being eaten by 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 fisher and by communities in Tai Tai Rizal so uh, the answer is 
largely unknown, but from the best data, but best scientific information that we have, some species may be least concerned because of their um, because of their life history. But uh, these assessments, so these red list assessments, are uh, are due for up, an update since I think 2010. Okay, thank you very much, sir uh, Ken. Uh, that thank you, thank you. That's the end of our question and answer portion, and I'll be returning the spotlight to our moderator, Mr. Floor. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Inshan, for facilitating our uh, open forum. Uh, congratulations. Also, congratulations to Kent for a great presentation. Very interesting one. So again, let me... Uh, let me remind our participants that if you want to receive a certificate of attendance, please uh, uh, answer our online evaluation form. I have already posted the link on the chat box. But uh, before we go to our closing program, let me just uh, share my screen. And uh, before we wrap up our uh, webinar, let us just uh, congratulate our speaker, uh, Kent Elson S. Sorgon, for a job well done. And uh, we are awarding this certificate of appreciation to him. And it reads as a certificate of appreciation is awarded to Kent Elson S. Sorgon for serving as resource person during the UPLB Museum of Natural History Biodiversity Seminar on scales, sales, and other fantastic tales, the past, present, and future of brief fish studies in the Philippines held today, July 20, 2022, from 2.30 to 4 p.m. via Zoom. And it's signed by our director, Dr. Marian P. De Leon. Congratulations, Kent. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, so uh, we invite you to uh, check out uh, the Museum of Natural History. Our website is at mnh.uplb.edu.ph. Uh, you have questions, concerns, or queries, uh, you can email us at mnh.uplb.edu.ph. Uh, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. It's at UPLB Museum. No? Like, follow, subscribe our social media accounts. We are in Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Instagram. Our handle is UPLB Museum. Do check out our uh, articles at Wikipedia and TripAdvisor. Just look for UPLB Museum of Natural History. And with that, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you for again being part of our biodiversity seminar series. Um, just uh, wait for our announcements for our next schedule. So, maraming salamat po. Take care.